everyone. Thanks for joining us at Azure Community Conference. We're so excited for you to be here, and I'm excited to be presenting to you today. My name is Adrian Taka, and I'm a senior developer advocate for MongoDB. And today, I'd like to talk to you, maybe get you to open your mind a bit about the topic of NoSQL. Specifically, hopefully, maybe at the end of this, I can get you to say yes to NoSQL. But more realistically, I'd hope you can leave this talk with a practical guide on when you would probably want to ditch relational databases. So if you're like most developers, relational databases are your bread and butter. SQL is your jam, joins are necessary, and data is relational. There are relationships between them. And for the most part, this has worked for quite some time. So naturally, when this new thing came along, or you first came upon it, uh, you heard of the term NoSQL. And when you started to dive into it, you wouldn't be wrong when you would say, this is kind of confusing, because the term has been used interchangeably with lots of other terms. So it was really hard to be clear on what exactly it is. What is NoSQL? We've heard it used as NoSQL, as non-SQL, as non-relational SQL, not only SQL, and many other variations of this uh, term. And so, not really sure about what this is, you'd be right in feeling confused. And if you're coming from a relational uh, database background like I did, I think the clearest way for me to understand, or for anybody to understand, is NoSQL is really just a different way of storing and modeling that data in, than the tabular form that we are already used to. Now, it's important to note that this kind of data model is not new. It seems new, but in fact, it's already existed since the 1960s. The reason it didn't gain popularity until about the late 2000s is because the cost of storage decreased dramatically, making the NoSQL data model and the way that it stores data much more pragmatic. So if it's not this tabular data that you're thinking, if it's not the rows and columns that we are used to, then you're probably wondering, well, how do we model it? What is the NoSQL data model? And there are actually a few ways to uh, do that. There are four. The first one is probably the one that you're most familiar with, and that is the document store. This is where hierarchical data is stored within documents. Uh, most of them are JSON-based. Uh, some are BSON-based. Uh, I think I may work for one that you know of. Uh, but these are the way, a uh, specific kind of way to store that data within documents. Another way to model it is the key value store. In this particular case, you have keys and values, and it's pretty self-explanatory. If you store your data and need quick access to it, uh, you may use very well-known keys, probably hashed, to quickly access those values. You think these are your Redis's, your RocksDBs, your Apache Ignites. Then there's the wide column store. So in this case, related data is stored as a set of nested key value pairs. And in particular, they're stored within a single column. Now, the reason we call it a wide column store is let's say you needed to access some similar data. You might store, say, a name and an address within a customer column, and then maybe you would store an item and the price in a product column. Well, these columns would all belong in a single place, and were you to query each row, you would be able to get all of this related data from those columns. So these are your Scylla DBs and your Cassandras. And finally, there's the graph store. And here we store data in nodes and edges. So the nodes store the entities or the nouns. They store the people, the places, the things that we want to keep track of. 
the edges are where we store the relationships or the verbs uh, that deal with the entities that we are storing. So these are your Neo4j's and your Janus graphs. And as we think about these four particular data models for different ways of storing data than a relational data model, well, the next logical question that might come up into your head is, well, is this better than a relational database? And technically I'm paid to say yes, but of course, as with most things in this industry, the real answer is that it depends. And so in order to truly understand why some differences matter and why those differences actually make certain types better than others, we need to do a refresher on a few important things, namely some fundamentals. So we need to import some dependencies into this actual presentation and really talk about them and think about them in a different way because they play a part in how our guide shapes out when we are considering whether or not to ditch a relational database. And so for that, we need to import the cap theorem, the acid properties, and the base properties from our fundamentals, bring them back into front of mind. So we'll start with cap theorem, also known as Brewer's theorem from Eric Brewer, who is the person who has shared this theorem with the world. And when we first learned about this theorem, this theorem states that in any distributed system that we have, out of these following three properties, at most, we can only have two. So two of the three can only exist at one time. And we can argue a little bit later whether or not that's still true. So these three properties are consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. And we're going to go into each of these just a little bit because it's important to be on the same page when it comes to all of this terminology, especially when discussing them in the context of making choices. So first, consistency. And in this case, it states that consistency is, make, is saying that a read from any node is guaranteed to return the most recent state. So let's see what this actually looks like visually. Let's say I have a cluster and I have four nodes on it. And this particular cluster, we can read and write to the cluster. And right now, the current state of my cluster is uh, it has hay there in all four of the nodes, right? Now let's say I want to update the value of hey there to kumusta. That's the Tagalog equivalent of hey there. And I figured uh, if this is already uh, pretty clear in your mind, uh, you may as well learn something else other than cap theorem if you already know cap theorem. So we make the right operation call to the cluster and that call is routed to probably the first node. And once that value gets updated, now what happens is it should replicate to the other nodes in the cluster. But if we have an inconsistent system, like here, you've just seen that once the write occurs to the first node, it may actually acknowledge to the client that it's done, when in fact it's not done. It still hasn't replicated to the rest of the nodes. And if we actually try to read a node before we were finished replicating, then that node might get routed to something other than uh, where the replication has finished, say node three, we would still receive the old value of hey there rather than the komusta we were expecting. So in this case, we say this is an inconsistent system because we're receiving stale data. Now in a consistent system, acknowledgement to the client is probably put on hold until the replication is finished. So even if we do get a call to read a value, we'll get the kumusta that we were expecting, no matter which node that the call gets routed to because we've waited for the replication to be finished. So that's consistency. A read from any node is guaranteed to return the most recent state. Now the A in CAP theorem stands for availability, and this states that 
every request received by a non-failing node will return a response, which means no errors or timeouts either. So let's say in the same cluster, we have two nodes that went offline. They're unreachable. An available system would always respond to the client, meaning that we can invoke read and write operations, and the client will always get a response back, even though there are two nodes that are down in the cluster. And quite simply, that is the availability. It's the fact that the nodes, despite them being down in the cluster, don't affect the system as a whole. We're still available to the client. And with this, no matter where we, what we do, even if we read, we still get a hey there, right? Despite the nodes being down. So that's availability. Every request received by a non-failing node will return a response. You will get something back. And this does not mean you get an error or a timeout. Lastly is the P in Cap Theorem, which is partition tolerance. So partition tolerance states that despite network partitions, or in other words, connections between nodes are severed, the system should still function. So let's go back to that same cluster again. Let's say in my cluster, uh, we have two nodes that are not able to communicate with each other. That's a partition. We call that a partition when the nodes are not able to talk to each other. A partition tolerant system ensures that despite this, despite nodes one and four not being able to communicate with each other, it still remains functional. The, fu the system as a whole remains functional. So if we get a call, a read call like we see here, we're still able to receive that hey there back. So partition tolerance, despite the fact that there are severed nodes, nodes can't talk to each other, the system as a whole is still functioning. Now, CAP theorem states that we can only choose two of these three. We can only choose two of consistency, availability, or partition tolerance. And even though we can still argue about that later, this means we have several combinations left for us to choose, right? If we can only choose two out of the three, this means this area in the middle here is not possible. And we're only left with a few other choices. But think about it, do, do we really? Because of the nature of distributed systems, we really only have to choose between two options because one has already been chosen for us. And I'll explain. One of the logical fallacies of distributed computing is that the network is reliable. It's not. <laughs> You'll even see here it's listed as the first item on Wikipedia on the official page of the fallacies of distributed computing. And that makes sense. Networks are not reliable. We shouldn't depend on them to be. They frequently go down, a lot of the times unexpectedly, and especially in this day and age, I'm sure every single one of us has, has experienced that a network is not necessarily always reliable. Because we understand that the network failures will occur, and they will at some point happen to our systems, we must tolerate partitions in a distributed system. So this is why I say partition tolerance is almost an automatic choice when it comes to distributed systems. So we're left with two choices. Do we choose a partition tolerant consistent system or a partition tolerant available system? Well, it depends, right? In a partition tolerant consistent system, we are sacrificing availability. We're choosing consistency over availability. Now, this is something that we may want when we know that errors and timeouts are acceptable. And because we are choosing consistency over availability, this probably means that the integrity of our data is much more important than its availability. Lastly, if consistency is a crucial part to the user experience, then absolutely we should choose consistency over availability 
So those are things to consider when we're thinking about uh, designing our system. Are errors okay to show to the client? Are they integral to the whole you know, application and system as a whole? This is why the age-old example of having uh, financial systems or systems of record, they need to be consistent. Those data points have to always be correct and always be consistent to the user. Now, if we choose the opposite, if we go with availability rather than consistency, maybe uh, the consistency is not necessarily required in our system. And there are uh, situations where that uh, may hold true. So in this case, a partition tolerant available system means it's always available to the user. There's always, you're always going to be able to interact with this system. And even though you don't get any errors or timeouts because you're always available, the downside to this though that you need to consider is that your data that you receive could be outdated. So yes, you'll be able to interact with it all the time, but that data could be stale. In this case, data accumulation is much more important than the integrity of the data. Maybe not all the time, but uh, if you are choosing this, usually that is the case. And this is okay because eventual consistency is acceptable in this kind of system. So this is why uh, receiving that outdated data can be okay sometimes. Now, the funny thing about this is that while I was working uh, on these slides, uh, I use slides.com for my slides, and I get this particular error. And as you'll see here, uh, I just wanted to get these things done, right? I wanted to update a couple things, make sure everything was polished. And at this point, I was thinking to myself, how funny, because right now, I'd rather have an available system than a consistent system, but alas. And before we get into ACID and BASE, the last thing I want to mention and for you to ask you to keep in mind for, about CAP theorem is that uh, almost a decade later, Eric Brewer himself has said that these decisions, choosing between the partition tolerant, consistent, or partition tolerant available systems, they're not really as binary of a design decision as we once thought they were. Now more and more, as we start seeing these different kinds of um, uh, models, is that it's more of a balancing act now. It's how much availability are we willing to sacrifice for consistency, or how much of the consistency are we willing to get uh, in lieu of availability. So instead of it being just a rigid uh, set of decisions, it's more like a balancing act that we need to focus on when it comes to these um, uh, properties. So that is CAP theorem, and keep, keep that in mind as we start going through our system. The next thing we need to talk about is the, uh, are the acid properties and the base properties. So again, as a quick refresher, because I'm sure we all need it with all the acronyms we have here. For acid, acid are these set of properties that we wish to adhere to when we need to guarantee certain things with our data. And in particular, acid, uh, this means that acid, atomic, the A in acid, it means that all operations in a transaction succeed or they don't. It all happens or it doesn't. C is for consistent, meaning that the data should stay in a consistent state after a transaction. The database should be structurally sound. I stands for isolated, meaning that if there are multiple con running transactions, they shouldn't contend with one another and shouldn't affect each other. And D stands for durable, meaning that upon any completed transaction that we do, even if there are any hardware or software failures, any changes that have been committed to the database should still remain. They should be permanent and they should not be affected by these software or hardware failures. So as I'm sure you know, these are very stringent uh, guarantees to keep in place and to adhere to. And that's why you usually see them with uh, more traditional relational databases. And there are lots of systems that require the strength of these kinds of guarantees. And as the emergence of NoSQL databases started coming along, 
there are now softer properties that have been developed that are usually um, used in relation with NoSQL databases. So if you're thinking these are actually a little too stringent, our system doesn't have to be that rigid. Maybe base properties are what you're looking for. So base, the BA stands for basic availability, meaning the database appears to be available, mostly available most of the time. S stands for the soft state. So this means that you're acknowledging the fact that the database state could change over time. And that's due to the last part, the E, eventual consistency. And that, of course, is saying that the database will be at a consistent state at some later point. So as you can see, these are much less rigid than the ACID properties. And uh, because of the looser properties that they, they show, they have been used in conjunction with NoSQL databases. And they are um, one other option for when you don't need such rigid properties, such as ACID. So now that we've covered the fundamentals, we're now finally ready to get to the, the guide that I'd like to share with you. And this is important because as we've seen it so far, I think the mistake that a lot of us make is we start with the tech, we start with the database, and then we consider and discuss and deliberate from that particular tech. But I think it should be the other way around. I think choosing the tech should be last. And to get to that point, we should make it easier for ourselves. We should have fewer options to choose from and options that we're confident will probably work with the system that we're intending to design. So this three-step guide on ditching relational databases, it's kind of like a, a framework. It's, it's kind of like a gut check to say, yes, if you are going towards a, a NoSQL database, then marking these three or getting a check for these three uh, means you're in a good spot and will probably benefit from a NoSQL database. So to turn that around in it, on itself and to not start with the tech, I think we need to start first with, is NoSQL even the way to go? And as you think about these steps that I go through, it's uh, I like to think of them as kind of a sieve, like a filter. So as we start going through each step, we eliminate choices that we know are not going to be good for us until we get to the end and can hopefully choose from a smaller number of options. So is NoSQL the way to go? How do we start with that and how do we decide that? Well, we need to take a look at our data. And in particular, we need to look at four characteristics of our data. These are data volume, data velocity, data variety, and data valence. What are these four? We'll get to those in a minute, but as a TLDR, as a good rule of thumb in general, if you have a high data volume or a large data volume, pardon me, and you have a high data velocity, a volatile data variety, and a high data valence, then you probably are good to go with NoSQL. NoSQL is better when your data has these characteristics. Right, let's go into those a little bit further so we're truly sure of what we mean by these four. So the first, data volume. This is meaning the size of your stored data. So the large data sets that we have now, I mean, if you think about the searches we do, how many pictures are uploaded to Instagram an hour, how many tweets go out uh, an hour, that's, that's kind of size uh, and massive data set that we are dealing with. And at this rate, these kinds of large data sets are usually just too unwieldy when we store them in a relational database. In fact, when we try to store this kind of data in a relational database, the query execution times uh, increase because the size of our tables increase, as well as the number of joins that it takes to get the data that we need. And this isn't necessarily a fault of the relational databases themselves, but rather the data model with which it adheres to. 
So because of this, we say that if you have a really large size of data, if the size of your stored data is gargantuan, then NoSQL data models are probably better for you because they were kind of built with this in mind. They were built to handle the larger data sets of today. Next is data velocity. And what we mean by data velocity is the rate at which your data changes over time. So there's two parts of this. There's the rate at which your data points themselves change, meaning the load of your writes, if you have high write loads, and also the actual data structure, so your schema, how often that changes. So if you think about this, if you pair the first characteristic, if you have a really large set of data and you pair that with a really constant high write load, you're really pushing the database to deal with a real a lot, right? You're dealing you're asking it to deal with high write loads and surging peaks of database activity. And these are things that usually relational databases are not prepared to handle, especially if they haven't been properly tuned. And secondly, the second part there, the structure, this is the more common benefit that's usually cited, right? If your data schema changes often, NoSQL is the way to go because that doesn't matter as much. And you all know the pain with which it takes uh, if we needed to add or remove a field before in a relational data model, right? So this uh, is certainly a use case that is becoming more common the data model or the data schema changing rapidly. And there are many reasons for that. There's the fact that businesses and enterprises move really fast. And with that, that means the data changes and the data needs of those organizations also move fast. Also, data acquisition is very, very experimental, which leads to a lot of changes in our schema. So, you know, a very common example is that, you know, quarter two, you were asked to capture certain data points from your application because you thought you might need them, right? And as you start to use this data, you'll find maybe, you know, a year down or even the next quarter, you found that certain data points were much more meaningful, much more valuable than others. And for the ones that aren't valuable, you'd probably want to get rid of them because they're no, of no use to you. This is a common uh, use case for why you would want to change your data schema as often. And with that, uh, NoSQL database models or NoSQL data models are much more properly equipped to do that. Third is the data variety. And we say that if you have a high data variety, then you probably want to go with a NoSQL database. So this means the type of data that you're storing. And again, with all the data that we capture from all the different devices we use, all the regions we have over the um, spans of time that we capture all of this data, there can be all kinds of data that we receive when we capture it. Data can be sparse or dense. It can be connected or disconnected. It can be structured, semi-structured, or irregularly structured. There's all kinds of ways, and I'm sure we all have very uh, great stories to share uh, when it comes to what kind of data we have seen from clients and that we've had to deal with. And I know one uh, argument that has been brought up before is that there are some databases that can store, like JSON, for example. But what's important to remember about this is that they, these kinds of uh, capabilities, they're usually built in as afterthoughts when it comes to relational databases. So because of that, you don't get the native capabilities of, say, embedded searches or indexes on nested fields the way that you would if you had used a, a native NoSQL database. And if you think about the four data models that I spoke about earlier, each of them have adopted their own strategy to handle the variety of data that we see today. So for that reason alone, we say that if you have a high data variety, NoSQL data models are probably the way to go for you.
And lastly, we come to data valence. So uh, I'm going to share a fun fact with you to help us understand what this means. The Latin root of valence means uh, value, or the Latin root of val uh, valence is the same as value, which is valere, which means to be strong, to be powerful, influential, or healthy. And uh, when we think about this word in other industries, I'll share that with you because I think it will help us understand it when we do use it in the context of big data. For example, in chemistry, valence means the combining power of an element. In psychology, it means the intrinsic attractiveness of an object. In linguistics, it's the number of elements that a word combines. And finally, in the context of big data, valence is the tendency of the individual data to connect, as well as the overall connectedness of the data sets. And don't worry, if this is still super confusing, I also had to write my own explain like I'm five version of this, which basically states the higher the valence that you have on your data set, the more connections there are within your data. So over time, as you collect all of this data, as we store all of this data, this data can become extremely dense, which means it becomes much more complex. And it also creates a lot of unevenly connected data. Now, this kind of data becomes much harder to analyze and to break down, especially with the existing analytics tools that we have, which have mostly been built on top of relational databases. So for this particular reason, and for the graph data model in particular, this is where um, graph data stores in NoSQL shine because of these connections that need to be made and need to be extracted. When you have scenarios like this that require the an analytic uh, side of these uneven connections of these semi-connected and all kinds of different kinds of connections within your data, a graph database is probably a better way to go. And for that, in general, we also say that NoSQL databases may be better and come to your rescue when relational databases aren't enough. So data volume, data velocity, data variety, and data valence. If you're on the higher spectrum of that, if all of that is good, if you have large data volume, a high data velocity, super volatile data, and high data valence, then it's pretty good sign that Yes, NoSQL is probably better for you and is a, a check for you. It says, go ahead, keep going down this path of possibly choosing a NoSQL database. However, if you're on the opposite end of these characteristics, if your data volume is not that large, you're not dealing with gargantuan sizes like Instagram or Twitter, if your velocity, if your data schema is relatively stable and doesn't change as often, or your rights are not as uh, high as they would be um, in the opposite system. Uh, and if your data is fairly uniform because of that stable data schema, and the valence is low, although this one is kind of a, a toss-up. But for the most part, if you're on the opposite spectrum of these characteristics, then answer is probably no. This is kind of, again, a gut check to say, you know what, maybe NoSQL is not right for you. And I know, you know, you'll say, oh, my job is to fully convince you that NoSQL is the answer for everything, but it's, it's not. And this is one way to uh, see that maybe a relational database is still probably the best bet for you. And so you can probably stop on this guide right now and uh, not further consider NoSQL. So as we continue moving, let's say we do end up ending on the higher end of that spectrum. We have a large data load, our data is very volatile, and we ended up choosing, yes, NoSQL is probably still the way to go. The next level of funneling for us is now to decide what kind of properties, what kind of guarantees we need in our system. 
So this is where I think it makes sense to now do the acid versus base comparison for our system. So specifically with these, there are things that we should consider up front. And that's the consistency model that we need for our system. That's how we want to scale and what we're going to prioritize, whether that's fast writes or safe writes. So of course, if we need our consistency model to be more pessimistic, we need that data integrity. It needs to be rigid and we have money to spare on high end hardware. No, we're going to scale vertically. And we need to prioritize safe writes because of that rigid consistency model that we need over fast writes, then okay, fine. Again, it's another uh, step, another check that says maybe even in this case, relational databases are still probably a better fit. The one caveat I will say is that there are NoSQL databases that do offer some ACID guarantees. And of course, to the extent that some are satisfied, this is always going to be a debate, but it still stands that there are NoSQL databases that do guarantee um, this, one of which is MongoDB. Since 4.2, version 4.2, we do offer multi-document ACID um, transactions and actually Neo4j, the graph database, is also one that guarantees um, ACID uh, transactions. And so thinking about this and thinking uh, if you do need these kinds of properties, for the most part relational databases will serve you well, but it's important to note that there are ever-changing NoSQL options for you. Now, if you think, well, maybe we don't need those kind of rigid kinds of properties and you align more with the base properties, maybe you want it to be a little bit more optimistic, more loose. You don't need those rigid guarantees for data integrity, which means you probably want to prioritize uh, fast writes over safe writes. And you know that you're probably going to scale with uh, commodity hardware horizontally. Then, yes, it's like another... Um, a nod to say, go ahead, you are probably going to benefit from a NoSQL database. And so for that, uh, we can continue on with our guide. So we've gone through step one, we've said, yes, um, our data fulfills those four characteristics. And after we've gone through our ACID and base comparison, we know our system aligns more with the base properties. Now, once we get to step three, what I like to call the cap filter, it's at this point that it should be much easier for us to choose the tech. It's at this point that I think we should be deciding among the different databases, not at the beginning. Because once we get to this point, we, are, should, we should be more confident in the choice that we make because we're very certain about how our data looks. We're very certain about the guarantees that we need in our system. And I'm going to assume that getting to that point means we've had those discussions with our team to be on the same page about what kind of system we are intending to build. So once we get to the cap filter stage, it should be just as, um, not simple, but at least fewer options to choose from as this. So if you know that you need a partition tolerant consistent system, if you know you can uh, sacrifice availability because you'd rather have consistency, then it should just come down to what kind of data model is best for you. If you need a document store and you know you need consistency, Maybe MongoDB is the choice for you. Or if you need a key value store, maybe you use Redis. At this point, it's almost like you have checked off all the other things, you've done your due diligence, that when you end up choosing these things, uh, you should be more confident in that choice. Because all of the other things you have gathered, you've researched, and you've discussed, and choosing the tech is now truly the last part of that um, analysis. Then, of course, on the other side, if you say, oh no, we don't need consistency, but we'd rather you uh, have availability, 
and you know that you need a wide column store. Well, Cassandra is probably your best bet once you've gotten to this point and have gone through this guide. Or if you need a key value store that's available, then maybe you choose uh, React over Redis, uh, depending on what you need, the consistency or the availability. So at this point, hopefully this has given you a different way of thinking uh, of how to choose a NoSQL database if it's right for you. Again, I want to reiterate the fact that usually we start with the tech and then we go through these tons of discussions, tons of debates back and forth because we started with the tech uh, and then only discussed all of these other important um, properties after the fact. But if, if we do it this other way, if we start with, hey, what does our data look like? And let's see if NoSQL is even right for us and then narrowed it down to, okay, what kinds of properties do we need for this system? And then finally choose the tech. I think we're, we're gonna be at a much better state and a much more confident choice if we do end up finding that a NoSQL database is right for us. Hopefully at the end, you will say yes to NoSQL databases. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my talk. Salamat, that's thank you in Tagalog. Uh, this is my Twitter. Please feel free to tweet any feedback here. Um, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors uh, as well as our communities for this awesome conference. Uh, I'm very, very honored to be a part of it. Uh, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the chat. I will try to get to them one by one and we'll try to answer them as best as I can and stick around for the rest of the amazing talks that are happening throughout the rest of this day. Thanks, bye.